Hey, I'm Scotty North, and this is Zenium Pro, where we talk all things accountants, brokers, and planners. We've got a big show for you guys today, so make sure you tune in and ask the questions. Now, on that note, wherever you're seeing the video, if you comment in the comment box, whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, wherever, uh, we will see your questions, and I'll be able to drag them on the screen and be able to discuss them with today's guest. And on that note, I'm told today's guest has a secret WhatsApp group with Bill Gates, so Bill can ask him some questions, and that his best coding work is done over a liquid lunch starting at 9 a.m. at the morning at his favourite restaurant. I'm talking none other than the founder of Hub One, Mr. Nick Bujard. Nick, how are you doing, mate? I'm doing superb. How are you, Scotty? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. Now, look, on today's Zenium Pro, I uh, wanted to get you on and discuss some things. And we titled it, you know, you told me to title it, actually, Ways to Stop Losing Your Clients' Documents. Mate, before we get into that, because that sounds kind of crazy, tell us a bit about yourself and Hub One and, and you know, why should uh, our partners today be listening to you? Who are you? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I'll, I'll look, I'll give you the potted history. Um, I, I grew up in a tiny island just north of France called Guernsey, which most of you should know is a decent offshore finance centre. And um, I, I wrote my first computer program at the age of seven, um, moved on to doing a, a bunch of technology in finance and IT. So I've worked for uh, JP Morgan, NatWest Bank, BZW, ABN AMRO, a bunch of different things. Moved to London um, doing that, um, then married an Aussie and ended up um, in Australia, um, then joined Microsoft and ended up in the US um, working on the team that wrote Windows XP, which you probably heard of, which was better than Windows 8 and not as good as Windows 10. Um, then built another company, sold it to a, a global. Um, and then when I left there, I was looking for things to do. And it was right in the early days of cloud computing. Um, and I got a phone call from um, Chris Ridd, who'd left Microsoft and joined Zero, And he said, hey, Nick, how about you help accountants move to the cloud? And I was like, oh, I don't know, you know, accountants. And, and he told me about it and told me some of the, the, the struggles they had with technology. And I thought, well, here's a, here's a great place to see if we can take what we've been doing in the big end of town, at the, in the big enterprises, and, and make that come down and deliver that to you know, accountants, brokers, and planners. So over the last 10 years, I've been building Hub One, um, which is a company that's now delivering software into that space, but I, I've learned lots about it. So I know lots of tech, and I know how to apply that yeah, you know, in an area where normally the people applying tech are, tend to be you know, fairly junior and fairly niche and don't have a broad global view of what's going on. So I have some wacky ideas, but, but I think they kind of work. <laughs> Well, I mean, you're a tech guy, so I just figure you have wacky ideas, mate. That just goes without saying, right? I mean, so, I mean, that's, that's is a very well condensed story. So thanks for that. So how do you actually, like that hub one that you started, how does it help accountants, brokers, planners? What, what do you do? So it's, it's, it's a really interesting question. Well, when we started looking at it, um, this was in the days when, you know, ZeroCon, which is Zero's big event, had six people at it in Australia so it's very small and we just started to talk about this this thing called the cloud and and nobody really knew what what, what it was and what it meant and I remember I was uh, doing an event in Canberra and and this lady came up to me and she said oh your cloud won't work now and I said well what do you mean it won't work and she said look up there not a cloud in the sky so so there were really people who knew stuff and, and people who didn't but but back in those days um, everybody had servers in their office and, and some of you probably still do and if you looked across an office you'd find this this server um, running um, with or sometimes three servers or sometimes five sometimes 15 I could tell some stories about that um, but you're all using some what we now call pretty legacy technology to store your documents store your files and do client accounting and, and do your processing and, and so the reason I, I thought that this would be a, a great comment about you know losing your documents is is really a kind of history lesson and, and the way I thought about it is most people today store their documents in files and folders right it seems like the way to do it but if you look back at the, the, the advances in technology, so like in the 80s, um, every computer, you know, Macs had just come out in, in like 87, 88. Um, and so there were some really early graphical user interfaces. And back then there were two main business applications. There was the file system, which was files and folders, 
And there was this thing called a card file, which was a really rudimentary database. Now, fast forward to now, and databases have become this huge and enormous and very, very smart and clever thing. Um, but file systems, most people are still stuck with files and folders. They're difficult to search. You put something in a Word document, it becomes what we call a pake. It's, it's really hard to see inside it and find things that you're looking for. Um, and people are still using that and they're wedded to that. And, and kind of we spent some time over the last 10 years saying, you know what, there's a better way. If you go and work for the major banks, if you go and work for a, a Westpac or an ANZ or, or a ComBank, they're using large document management systems, most of which now run in the cloud. And the beautiful thing about the cloud is it's way more democratic. Um, 20 years ago, if you wanted a large scale document management system like Documentum or some of those, you'd be spanking you know, a couple of million dollars just to build the infrastructure. Now you can get cloud document management for, for you know, 30 bucks a user a month, which is really making a difference. But when we looked at it, we found there were things missing. There was not really much integration into your email client. It was hard to create standard letters and documents. This stuff didn't integrate into practice management systems. And so what we did as a business is we wrote the software to fill those gaps, to kind of deliver solutions which actually rounded out that document management story for people in you know, medium to small scale financial businesses uh, in Australia and New Zealand. So that's kind of the history there. Okay. So you've got a better system than just going to file explorer and searching on keywords because that's pretty much oh. how i do things scotty anything's better than going to file explorer <laughs> and searching on keywords right um, what? You, you, i've used it forever <laughs> in fact one of the things i really like about that is you, you may notice you know we've, we've continually got faster and faster computers but, but your computer doesn't run as fast as it used to. And, and part of that is this thing underlying every Windows PC and every Mac called um, you know, the Finder or the Spotlight or, or Windows Search. And that's desperately trying to search every document on your PC to find, find words in it. Documents are more than just you know, words and, and files and bits in them. Wouldn't it be nice if we could, what we call, decorate those files with additional data? And in the technical world, we call that metadata. But say, this document's for this client, it's about this subject, it's for this tax year. And if you decorate your documents for that, it's not just searching, but you can start to use your documents like a database, if you know what I mean. I can say, I want to see all documents for this client group in this tax year to do with um, you know, property. And, and suddenly you've got this subset of documents, which makes it not just easy to find things, but easy to find out what you were talking to your client about back in 2010 um, around property. So you can go and have that ongoing meaningful discussion. You're kind of unlocking the data that exists within your documents. And I, I think that's the way we should be playing it now. The other thing is, if you imagine, I, I want you to think about it, you're writing a really important document for a client and you've got lots, let's say you've got a thousand clients, and you go put that in the wrong folder and then go on holiday for two weeks, I bet you'd never be able to find that document again. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I've never done that, mate. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's, uh, that's, that's crazy. So, uh, so what you're saying is that the, the file system works from... I don't get too deep here, but you know, when I, you know, clients, John Smith, you know, um, tax return, whatever, sort of that hierarchy, that metadata you're talking about, which is what you work with, I'm assuming with Hub One, is that yep. is more of a base level, and it goes into the forms that full data from the bottom, and then that's how you search it. Yeah, if you, if you kind of think of it's, it's kind of going from 2D to multiple dimensions. So rather right, th right now, if you create folders, you can you, you can create a folder for the clients and then a folder for the year and then a folder for what you're talking about. But then you're losing. You've just got one one axis or, or one dimension of being able to filter through things with metadata. You can get a lot richer. You can go show me general correspondence in the last five years or, or and it allows you to slice and dice those things and also extract. So one of the things we do is you're able to extract data from documents. Let's say um, you're sending a letter to each of your clients every year saying your tax refund or, or the amount you need to pay is this amount of money. Imagine if you could filter 
by that or even sum that and say go right the number of tax returns we've done in the year 2020 equals a, a total refund amount of, of whatever that amount is that's great data to have in your firm but right now it's it's kind of locked up in documents and so we're about you know, unlocking that data that right now is living just as as, as unmanaged text inside documents and, and and I think that's key for using your data in your firm the best way you can Okay. All right. Well, that was going to be my next sort of question. So we've done a bit of a background of what, you know, what you're talking about, how you see the data storage perhaps differently. So what's the, the advantages for a firm, you know, small, medium, large firm? Obviously, the bigger ones have probably gone to cloud and that already and probably a lot of the smaller ones, but are they utilising it properly? Is there a better way to use the, the cloud and these services? Yeah, so, so, so cloud's a really interesting construct. And um, when we saw this uh, actually coming about probably 20 years ago now, so, so to give you some background, 20 years ago, um, almost now, um, the, the big battery company Energizer went to Microsoft and, and they went, guys, your stuff's rubbish. Um, it keeps falling over. It doesn't run as well as it should. And, and Microsoft, and, and I was part of that team, went back to Energizer and said, well, we actually think our stuff's really good. We think it's how you're running it. And so we promised Energizer that we'd run their infrastructure, their computers for them to prove it could be done really well. And, and out of that project... So Microsoft, we, said, yeah. so, so Microsoft said, it's, it's not our problem, Energizer. It's, it's user error, right? That's the, tip, that's the, that's the tech answer. <laughs> that's all they well, did. They well, just said, they said, user <laughs> error, restart your machine. <laughs> No, no, the first thing we said was restart your machine. And, and when, <laughs> when that didn't work, we said it was user error. Okay, okay. Fact, all right, go, go on. Go on. <laughs> in fact, we, 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 have a, we have a term in the industry. You know, the, the IT industry is full of those acronyms. My favorite one is the PBCAC. And people say, well, that, I say, there's a problem between the back of the chair and the keyboard. You know, or, or, or we have software, we have hardware, and we have wetware, which is the human that actually operates it. And it's always a, a wetware problem. But <laughs> before I dive into that, <laughs> going back to where we were, we, we, we told Energizer that we thought we could run their computer systems better than they could. And as Microsoft, we then built data centers and infrastructure to run for one customer. And it became pretty apparent that actually the better model is if we ran the technology for every customer. And, and so that was really the birth of centralizing or hosting environments. And then we moved forward really to delivering what, what we now call cloud, which is an awful lot bigger than, than that original hosting idea, but allows us to build software, allows people, not just us, but Microsoft Hub One, all sorts of people, to build software which scales globally, which has very, very little failure. Um, because of the way the economies of scale we can get and how we construct it, which is available globally, but it means customers don't have to install servers and manage directories and do backups, and, and all of that gets managed. And, and that's really a huge revolution, just first of all, just taking what we had before and running it that way. The next revolution is now we've done that. What can we do with the data, what can we do, what facilities can we turn on? I'll give you an example. It used to be when I ran a Skype for Business on a customer premises, you needed to have you know, at least eight servers, you needed to have integration with the phone system, you need to have all sorts of different things up and running and working. Um, now you can go to the cloud, and at least if you're in North America or a Telstra customer, you can go online, type some things into a screen, and suddenly telephony is then turned on through your provider, which used to be ridiculously hard and now is about as hard as getting a SIM card from a Telstra shop. So all of those things, the cloud has enabled to us to get rid of all of that grunt work, if you will, all of that setting up servers and doing firewalls and routing and switching and backups and all of those are acronyms and actually have that run for you by the people who actually write the software so that we can all focus in going up the what we call the value chain and delivering features which actually help your business move quicker, faster, better. And all of that's available. And all we need to do now is teach people to take advantage of it. And, and we can drive enormous value into almost any business. Okay, so with that in mind, what is the best way for a firm to use this sort of thing? And I've got a two-pronged question. I mean, how does it benefit the firm and how does it benefit the, the customer, their client? You know, because is there higher communication? You know, it's got to be, 
if this all this technology is there, it's got to be markedly easier all round. Okay, so let's start with the firm and then let's add the customer into the mix. The cloud enables a bunch of collaboration scenarios to start with, so you can collaborate e more easily with each other. But the second thing it's allowed, and, and quite timely with, with the global pandemic, is you suddenly one of one of the features of cloud is it's 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 universal access so i can access securely access my business systems now if they're in the cloud from anywhere i can do it from my mobile phone in the car i can do it from a customer site i can do it working from home as if i was working in the office and and it's funny you mentioned the um the liquid lunches at the beginning of your intro scotty because um somebody said to me very early on what would be your ideal outcome of cloud computing and i said being able to work my entire day from the pub um and and i managed to do that in, in, in 2005. um although i did find after okay. about three o'clock it, it all got a bit woolly and, and not very good but but up to then i was on fire um <laughs> So, so, so there, there's, there's those things. The other thing are about collaboration and communication with your client. Um, if you think about, you know, go back in time, or, or maybe for some of you, go back in time to yesterday. If you want a client to sign a document, um, you need to print the document, stick it in an envelope, send it to your client. They undo it. They then sign it. They put it in an envelope and send it back to you. And that's the really traditional way of doing things. Um, we've now been able to email documents to clients, and they print them and sign them and send them back to you. But we actually find if you really want a client to send a document, sign a document, if you put an electronic signing solution in, make it drop into their mailbox with a button saying sign here, you almost get the same effect as, as most of you do when you install software. So one of the things we find when people install software is you have the yes, I accept the terms and conditions and most humans never read the terms and conditions. And, and, and that's kind of funny and, and probably interesting in a financial services point of view because it means people don't read the small print. But um, we actually, that was used in the UK where somebody created this online game and part of signing up for the terms and conditions, you promised to do two hours of community service in your local community. Um, and they were taken to court and that, that order got enforced. And so a whole bunch of people, I think about 400 people in the UK had to go and do two hours of community service just for downloading an app. So make sure you read the T's <laughs> and C's. That's, that's great. I mean, we could solve all sorts of you know, do the Clean Up Australia Day and all sorts of things doing just by <laughs> signing up on apps. <laughs> you, you could in a way, but it's about that speed of collaboration. And, and certainly Adobe, who run one of the major e-signing platforms, and that's the one that's built into Xero, um, will tell you that 80% um, you're 80% more likely to have a document signed if you send it via an e-signing platform than if you do it any other way. Um, so that collaborations like super key but the other thing is yeah you know, as, as a customer and and i'm okay i'm a tech but i've got millennial kids um we've kind of gone off um wanting to talk to someone you know and as i know in the the broking and, and the accounting world you know i just I'm, I'm moving an accountant for one of my 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 clients at the moment and one of my businesses at the moment and somebody gave me a referral so i emailed him and he said oh give me a call and i went Oh, I don't want to phone someone, you know, I want to do an online form or I want to communicate with somebody electronically at my leisure, not not suddenly hit on a phone call and get awkward questions. And that's that's very reminiscent of, of what's happening. And when we think that, you know, as of next year, over 50 percent of the workforce will be millennials, they expect to act, work with their service providers electronically. So the cloud gives you a cost-effective way to communicate with your clients electronically. It's all there. You just have to turn it on. Um, and it's more than just a form. It's being able to have almost every transaction you do be able to be done without talking to a human. doesn't mean you get rid of human interaction, but it does mean you can streamline a whole bunch of things. And then you can scale bigger and better. Well, so my thinking of that would be so that the tech controls the the littler jobs, that initial interaction, you know, the filing, all that sort of thing, which leaves the advisor time to do what they do best, which is that higher level communication with the client. And obviously that's where the more profitability is. It doesn't matter if you're an accountant, broker or planner. 
and then that's what the customer wants at the end of the day the the customer doesn't want their advisor to be you know typing things into a computer or doing data entry or filling out forms or making spreadsheets work they they don't want that at all they want you to be providing advice and going you know given your circumstances the best lender is this or or given your circumstances your most tax effective strategy is is that so if you make it obvious to the client that you have the tech doing the grunt work, um, then you can focus on really that high value activity. And we're noticing that not just in the financial services industry, but lots of industries are moving up the value chain. And even if you look at the big boys, you know, ANZ Bank has a massive project at the moment to take their, I think they've got about 1,200 different paper forms to do different things. They're putting every one of those online. And, and that's, that's exciting. You know, we get government and banks and everybody doing that. Then we all get rid of a whole bunch of inefficiencies and get faster and quicker and better at doing things. Bye bye, file room, really. <laughs> Mate, I reckon when you take a loan out with ANZ, you, you need about 1,200 forms of theirs that you've got to fill out. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's, that's, that's a finance, uh, mortgage broking topic. So, where's the future? I mean, if, if I can ask you another two-pronged question, where's the future going for overall tech and where's the future for this SME sort of stuff? Like where can the you know small business provider actually access some of this big idea picture stuff and what can it do for them? Okay, so so that's a, it's a, it's a super interesting question. There's lots of thoughts and strategy about that. I was at a conference recently where we were talking about a lot of that. So it boils down to, to a, a few things. The, the first thing it boils down is the what we call the democratization of technology. The technology today you get in a G Suite or an Office 365 would be absolutely unattainable to an SMB, um, even 10 years ago. Um, and if you tried to do it on premises, it would be unattainable. Some of the things you can do with this platform, because it's run by the vendor, is, is just amazing. Um, so that's the democratization of tech. You then get the democratization of coding, um, which is which is really new and funky. So I'm going to use some some Microsoft products, which are part of Office 365. There's a, this thing called the Power Platform, and in that is a tool called Flow and a tool called Power Apps. And they allow you to build, without any coding knowledge at all, first of all, portals for your client to log in and do things with, automation, so you can automate your business processes if you know what they are. And, and this isn't just within your Microsoft suite. This integrates with all sorts of other things. So if you want to say, if somebody responds to a MailChimp message and fills a form on my website, create an entry over here and send them a document and then send them a physical letter, you can codify all of that. And, and finally, um, um, a couple of things. Power Apps allows you to build apps for your staff to make them more efficient. Like you can, in about 10 minutes, you can build a, you know, I'm sick today or I'm taking leave app. Um, we built in a week a, um, an app for a, a school to be able to notify their staff when there were COVID issues going on um, just by taking some templates. But the next thing that's happening is artificial intelligence and machine learning. And that's where the computer's starting to get really really smart and, and this stuff's if you don't understand if you haven't seen it it's, it can be quite wacky and quite strange and, and i'll give you an example um target in the us created a machine learning algorithm which detected whether people coming into the store were pregnant or not so they could sell them nappies and all sorts of <laughs> pregnancy stuff they got sued a, a father of a, a 16 year old girl sued the store for insinuating that their daughter was pregnant and before the case came to trial, he had to apologize because it turns out she was pregnant. She didn't know that. and she hadn't and she hadn't told her parents. And and that's mm. the power of you know, machine learning. So and then you So we we are seeing it. less yep. Terminator and, and more minority report. Is that what I'm is that what I'm hearing? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they could be Terminator too. I, I, certainly, if you're, if you're bored one afternoon, um, do a, a YouTube search for Boston Dynamics robots and, and oh, be very yeah, afraid. I've done. Yeah, <laughs> but half of that's mocked up. But the, yeah, but so really, we are looking more. You know, like Minority Report, they were just on the the Retina scan wherever you go. But I mean, you're talking about machine learning that was based on uh, you know habits and things that you do, or or what you know where you go and other bits and pieces, and then that provides data to firms and companies and what have you yeah to, to give try and give you a really simple overview the way machine learning 
is kind of like human learning. So what we do to the machine is we say, here's a bunch of data of people moving around our store, and here's all the people who are pregnant. Now, from people moving through this other store, tell me which ones you think are pregnant. And it works out what all the patterns and things which would make that happen. You know, they, they go and look at this, or they pause longer here, or they, 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 they walk slower here. I, I don't know what the metrics are, and nor does anyone, by the way. The computer works that out. And it gets more and more accurate the more data you give it. Um, so, for example, we wrote a machine learning algorithm to, to work on our support desk, our IT support desk. And that took the number of tickets we had to handle by a human from 80 a week down to two a week because it was able to answer them better than our staff were. Because that kind of, and that tech's available today. It's not, it's not pie in the sky. So what sort of things can a SME type firm or an accountant, broker and planner, what can they access to help them directly and obviously increase their pro productivity and profitability? That's, that's a really interesting question. Well, you're starting to see things already. So if you look at how Xero does bank reconciliations, they're starting to implement AI technologies into that. So it already will pick up where it should reconcile and codify a, a, a payment to. Um, you're starting to see smarter and smarter applications appear from vendors. And what you're not going to do as an SMB is go build a machine learning platform or big data platform yourself. That's expensive, it's difficult, it takes forever. But we're starting to be able to leverage platforms that others have built. Um, for example, um, a, a, um, a computational um, group out of Stanford University have built an algorithm which will detect anomalies in credit card statements. So all you need is a credit card statement and it will tell you where there's been um, items of fraud or theft. And imagine if you could run that across the statements for all of your you know, not-for-profit customers if you're an accountant. Or imagine if you could run an anomaly detection algorithm across somebody's application for a mortgage and work out if it was real or not. Those types of things are well on their way down the track now and you're going to start to see them incorporated into the cloud products you already use. Um, it's already, there's, there's a few examples already in Microsoft Office. Um, so Dictate in Microsoft Office will now allow you to dictate your documents and that's way more accurate than that's ever been. But I used one the other day, I was giving a presentation to the Minister for Science and Technology from Vietnam who only spoke Vietnamese and PowerPoint real-time translated my presentation and put at the bottom subtitles in Vietnamese that he said were rather good and that was in real time. Yeah, that's, that's impressive. I mean, I reckon I could use the PowerPoint Translate just so people could understand what I'm trying to say in a presentation. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, I don't that's think pretty good done, going they, over there. They, they haven't done a Queensland to English yet, but I, I know it's going. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. But I, t I will say I have been using for a few months the dictate function on both Outlook and Word, um, and I've found it to be exceptional. In fact, I write my articles most of the time on that now, and it's... It's actually saved a big lot of time and and uh, a little anecdote when I was at school and, and I was at that age group where we went from paper to typewriter to computer and uh, they had the young teacher come in in one of the, the subjects, I think it was film and TV, and uh, she's saying, right, no more written, you know, you've got to do it on a computer. I'm like, oh, I don't do that on a computer, I use a pen, right? We were like, ah, oh, nah. <laughs> And, and she goes, oh, no, you know, you need to learn to type. I'm like, look, by the time I need to do that stuff, I'll be able to talk to the computer and it'll type it out for me. And it, lo and behold, here we are, mate. That's exactly what we're doing. It's, uh, you know, and really only five years later, as you can see, like I'm not very far out of school at all. <laughs> exactly. Well, I do remember a maths teacher because I'm a bit further out of school, Scotty. I do remember a maths teacher turning around to me and I was at this horrible all boys school in Bergeard. And I said, yes, sir. He said, you're not going to spend your life walking around with a calculator in your pocket, you know? Um, and I, I look at my smartphone now and I go, how wrong was he? <laughs> that's gold. Uh, that's gold. All right. Well, Nick, um, any closing comments? Because uh, I don't want to hold you up and uh, we, we keep our shows for about 30 minutes. So anything that, you know, if there's, someone wants to contact you about a specific thing, like how do we get a hold of you? Yeah, so I'm really simple to contact Nick at hub1.com. So H-E-B-O-N-E dot com. Um, easy to find. And, and I like, I'm happy to take questions about anything. Um, I'm, I'm a, yeah, a 
run a business, but I'm a technologist who really likes new and innovative technology, and I like to keep at the what we call the bleeding edge of what's happened. So I'm interested in chats about anything, and, and if you're in states that aren't locked down, I'm always up for a beer um, while I'm trying to work from the clouds from the pub. Yeah, at, at 9 a.m. So, uh, <laughs> all right. And for those that are listening, once again, uh, that's nick at hub1.com. So you can hit him up on that. And, of course, you can contact us directly on hello at zenium.live. Uh, we're even more advanced than Hub1. We don't have a .com. I mean, we're either behind or in front. I don't know, mate, but that's a topic for another day. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so it's hello at zenium.live. You can jump on there. And thanks for everyone watching today and, of course, listening on our podcast. And, Nick, thank you very much for joining us. Hey, thanks, Scotty. It's been lots of fun. All right, that's great. Yeah, that's uh, Zenium Pro. We've been talking to Nick Bajard of Hub One. So make sure you hit him up for any questions that you got. If you're an SME or SMB and you're an accountant, broker, and planner, and you want to know how to best use the cloud or new technologies, I would say Nick is the man to talk to. All right, that is our second Zenium Pro show. Thank you very much for watching live and, of course, on the replay. And we are talking all things accountants, brokers, and planners. And I'm your host, Scotty North. And don't forget, we'll be back in a couple of weeks with another Zenium Pro.